Summer is here and it's only getting hotter. Today, we're talking about how much energy your AC system is sucking from your car, whether you have a traditional gas powered car versus an electric car. We'll also look at the mechanics and science, find how cooling and heating systems work. And stick around to the end of the video to hear how the Tesla Cybertruck's heat pump can decrease your home electricity bill by 500%. Take a guess. What consumes the most electricity in a conditional combustion engine car? If you guessed heated windscreen and rear windows, well, those consume about 120 watts of energy. Windshield wipers consume between 80 to 150 watts. Heated seats consume anywhere from 100 to 200 watts. Sunroof motors need 200 watts. Now get this. Not only does the AC system get its energy mainly from the engine, it also consumes at least 500 watts of electricity from your car. But when it comes to the most energy consuming component of a combustion engine vehicle, the culprit is the starter motor. Once the engine gets too hot, the radiator fan will start. And in the process, it'll suck 800 watts out of your car's battery. With electric cars, things are a bit different. Let's start with the things you can control. The first and most obvious one has to do with how you drive your electric vehicle. Driving at higher speeds requires more energy from the battery. Also, driving at steady speeds on a highway will drain an EV battery a lot quicker than driving in stop and go traffic. That's because all EVs have regenerative braking systems. It's the reason why EVs get better gas mileage in a city driving compared to highway driving, unlike gas-powered vehicles. Something else that can drain a lot of juice from an EV battery is how hard you press the pedal when you accelerate. Smoother acceleration means longer battery life. On the other hand, other battery draining factors include things like the size of your EV, the total passenger load, and how much cargo you carry in your EV. The lighter the load, the less energy your battery will need to support. So, if you're planning on taking your EV out for a road trip and want to maximize battery life, I have two words for you. Pack light. Unfortunately, there are other factors that drain your EV battery which you can't control. For example, the weather. When it's cold outside, your battery works harder and drains faster. One study found that EV range can drop by as much to 32% in freezing temperatures. Also, the colder it is outside, the more you have to heat the inside of your car, which saps additional juice from the battery. But if you drive in a state that's cold all year long, your best bet is to turn on the heated seats in your EV because heated seats actually use much less energy than traditional heating. The reason is, heated seats usually work by warming up a heated element that doesn't require fans to circulate the air. Funny enough, if you live in a state that's hot all year long, that can be a drainer too. The minute you blast the AC out of your EV, your car battery range will be impacted. Believe it or not, controlling the cabin and battery temperature drains the most battery power, second only to driving the EV. Speaking of cabin temperature, here's how the air conditioning systems work in a car. Not many people know this, but the AC system removes heat from the passenger compartment. Technically, it's called a heat pump. It does this by absorbing the heat into a refrigerant that then transports the heat away from the passenger compartment. This heat is then released into the air outside by the AC condenser in front of your car's radiator. The main components of an air conditioning system include the compressor, condenser, expansion valve, and evaporator. Normally, the compressor is driven by the engine using the drive belt and the magnetic clutch. In EVs and hybrids, compressors are driven by electric motors. The condenser works by transferring heat to the air. In the condenser, gas is condensed and naturally changes into a liquid refrigerant. In the expansion valve, the high-pressure refrigerant forces the liquid refrigerant through a small hole which reduces pressure and temperature. The expansion valve is also responsible for adjusting the quantity of refrigerant that passes to the evaporator. The finer piece is the evaporator. It's made up of a tank, tubing, and fins that are exposed to the air in the passenger compartment. Heat transfers to the fins and then is absorbed into the refrigerant mist. Then the refrigerant absorbs this heat, changes it back to a gas, and goes from the evaporator back to the compressor. And the process repeats itself over and over again. The pressure sensor is another important piece for safety reasons. If the pressure is wrong, it could damage the entire cooling system. Something you don't want to happen. When you turn on your heater, warm coolant flows all the way to the heater core. The heater blower transfers the air from the heater core to your car. The thermostat is responsible for maintaining a constant temperature of the coolant. Now let's imagine you live in Texas. It's summer, it's blistering hot, but you have to drive your EV to work. You plug in your phone, which sucks two amps of energy. Once you turn on the AC, that number shoots up to eight amps. Let's say you sit in traffic for an hour with the AC blasting. Well, you're gonna lose about 10 miles of driving range solely because of that AC system. What about the heater? Well, to understand how heating impacts an EV, first we have to talk about three types of heat transfer. 
The first type is radiation. Think of the Sun. We get electromagnetic waves that travel 93 million miles from the Sun to the Earth. The direct electromagnetic radiation from the Sun then hits you. It's the same idea when it comes to X-rays and microwaves. Those are all radiative heating, just at different frequencies of the electromagnetic spectrum. But here's the problem with radioactive heating and cooling. It's not very efficient. The second type of heat transfer is conduction. Think things like burning your hand on a cast iron pan on a stove. Conductive heating basically means that you heat an object to certain materials, take iron for example, it conducts the heat to another part of that same object. So if we keep thinking about the cast iron pan, not only does the actual pan get hot, the handle does too. The third and last type of heat transfer is convection. Actually, this is the most common type of heat that we use today. It's transferred through the air. Right now, as you're watching this video, there are tiny molecules of air that are moving at different velocities all around you. If one of these molecules is moving very fast, it'll bump into another air molecule that's moving slower and transfer some of its higher velocity energy. If you ever feel like the air around you is hot, it's basically because all those air molecules are bouncing off your skin. You might recall from school that air contains water molecules. Basically, water molecules have a high heat capacity. They're good at transferring heat. That's why we refer to heat as dry or humid. Dry heat in the desert, for example, means that there are fewer water molecules in the atmosphere in the air. That's why 90 degrees of dry heat feels a lot cooler than 90 degrees of humid heat. This is why there's a world of difference of comfort between Arizona and Texas. When it's hot in summer, the air molecules around you are hotter than your skin. They're moving at a higher velocity. And the minute they touch your skin, they're going to transfer all that energy to your skin and blood vessels. Convective heat is also the type of heat transfer you see with cooling systems. In an AC unit, warmer air passes over coils. The energy is then transferred out of the cool liquid inside the coils. The liquid inside the coils heats up and that cools the air down. With heating systems, it's the opposite. In these systems, the faster, warmer energy from the coils is transferred to the cooler air to make it hotter. Now there's a lot of excitement around the Tesla heat pump. If you're wondering what the big deal is, here's the thing. The new Tesla heat pump is way more energy efficient than the standard resistive heating system that older Tesla models came with. In fact, the Model Y was the first Tesla to come with a heat pump, which made it 300% more energy efficient. And that's important for an EV since this means it'll drain your battery less in cold weather and therefore retain more driving range. They say the Cybertruck heat pump has an efficiency rating of 500 and can potentially decrease your home electricity bill by 500%. The Cybertruck's heat pump only uses one kilowatt hour of energy, generate five kilowatt hours of heat for the entire cabin. On top of that, the Cybertruck's heating pump can even operate in temperatures below 30 degrees. Here's how it works. Inside the Tesla heat pump, you'll find the fluid called Freon. This liquid can boil at around room temperature and also recondense. It also has a high thermal capacity. The Freon is a pretty bad greenhouse gas, but it works well in Tesla's heat pump. The indoor coil in the heat pump has little fins. In an air conditioning mode, it works like an air conditioner. Simple enough. Energy is transferred to the liquid inside the coil and is then removed from the atmosphere from the air molecules. This cools down the air molecules by slowing down their velocity. All this energy is transferred into the liquid, the liquid will evaporate and turn into gas. The compressor cycle then squeezes it and compresses the gas, which turns to heat. Think of a can of spray paint, for example. The minute you shake it and spray it, it starts to feel really cold in your hand. That's because the faster moving molecules get out of the can faster, and this cools the can down. On the other hand, when you compress air, the velocity of the air molecules increase, and therefore temperature rises. Going back to Tesla's cooling system, air is blown over the hot compressed gas that condenses down into a cooler liquid. The expansion valve releases the pressure, just like opening a can of soda. The expansion cools down the liquid very quickly. In a normal AC system, the line that comes out of the compressor typically goes up into the condenser. The hot gas gets condensed back into a liquid and the heat gets released into the atmosphere. But with the Tesla system, there aren't any refrigerant lines, just glycol. This reduced costs. A Tesla liquid-cooled condenser acts as a heat exchanger. Basically, each plate has one side that has refrigerant and one side has glycol. Because of this, there's a lot of surface area for heat to move between the liquids without them mixing up. With supercharging, a Tesla can use the waste heat to warm up the battery. That's why you'll see so many expansion valves. It ends up being more efficient and a whole lot cheaper to just move the heat that already exists instead of creating new heat from scratch. So as you can see, especially for electric vehicles, seeing how the heating and cooling systems can drain your EV battery and reduce your driving range, it's imperative for EV makers to develop even better heating and cooling systems. But now you tell me, what do you think about the Tesla heat pump? Please share your comments below. If you like this video, please like, share, and subscribe. Thanks for your support.